All right, so the, the first question on this piece of paper is uh, one that we deal with all the time, and it always has the hopeful Just pleading of the clinician. So and it asks, is LP really needed to rule out subarachnoid yeah. hemorrhage after a negative CT? And it notes CTs are better than they used to be, and the answer is uh, yes, LP is still really needed. And the reason is is that when you look at the papers that say how good CT is, they include all subarachnoids. And so when some, and remember, subarachnoids are divided up uh, by clinically by their Hunt Hess score. And the ones that are, if their Hunt has three or four, which means they're, you know, in a pre rutabaga post subarachnoid bleed state, they're, you know, really screwed up by it, the CT finds all those and it's largely irrelevant because there's nothing to be done. The one that you have to find is the Hunt has one, so the person with just a headache um, who may have had a sentinel leak. Um, and CT, regardless of its skills, and it's interesting to watch the radiologists contort themselves. Oh, we could see 4,000 cells, 3,000 cells. Um, they can't. Um, and they only call those after the person's clipped. Um, then the late read says, yeah, it could be subarachnoid. It's very, very clear. And if you talk to people who do ex expert witnessing, and do a, I do a little bit of it, but the, the people who do a lot of it will tell you that these cases keep coming up. Where so, someone thought that they could not do a CT, uh, not do an LP after a negative CT, um, and they get smoked on it because the person was a Hunt Hess one sentinel leak bleed, um, and even a negative LP can be, can still be have disease. But LP is is very very sensitive and specific for this. Just just, right just hang on with that question for one second. I, so I mean, and just to take it one step further. First of all, I don't agree that LP can be negative with a subarachnoid hemorrhage. I think that's hey. one of the few tests that, one of the few tests that you can actually say that it's negative for subarachnoid hemorrhage because it is by definition not a subarachnoid hemorrhage if there's no blood cells in the LP. But uh, just to take it, but, but, but just to take uh, one step from uh, further than what Billy was saying is that the, the issue here is one of spectrum bias that the CTs, uh, the study that we have, the studies that we have on this quote these extraordinary sensitivities to CT and in large part because of the spectrum bias. They're not picking up the, the uh, more minor one. But let me just, I want to take another issue that comes up all the time that people ask me about, which is that, okay, so um, I got this, uh, this issue about the CT thing, but why don't we just do an MRA or, or a CT angiogram? Well, the other day. Oh, we did? I did. You did in total? Okay, so that's done. Well, no, the, remember we talked about the concept of you're going to pick out all these people who have a headache yeah. and have an aneurysm, but the yeah. two don't relate to each other. There are very, very few people, very, very few people that I've talked to that understand that. And uh, just to, to know, uh, and, having, and, and having actually been through it myself with patients, to know how horrible it is for someone to sit in a neurosurgeon's <laughs> office when the surgeon is sitting there proposing a very, very scary surgery with a high mortality to see if they could, uh, if they're going to clip some aneurysm they see there on, on CTA or MRA, not knowing if that was actually responsible for the symptoms. And 2% of the population yeah, walks and around even, And even higher, if you're 60 years old, 70 years old, it goes up to 3 4%. So just, just if only that emergency physician would have done the LP to know whether or not we were dealing with an L, uh, a, a, a subarachnoid hemorrhage back then, we could know to make this, you know, know enough to make this decision of whether to do the surgery. So, so please encourage your, explain this to your colleagues that doing a CT angiogram or an MR angiogram is not a sufficient thing to know whether or not they had a subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is the key to know whether or not you need to intervene on them. And I often see a clinician do, I, I've seen the residents do it, I've seen it in the private world, where the clinician has the negative CT, the patient's headache is gone, right? That's the natural history. They go, oh, it's better. You know, and so then they go in and they give a very skewed presentation to the patient. Well, to really rule it out, to get the last little bit of confidence, I need to harpoon your central nervous system through your back with this needle. And they set it up and then the patient does what you'd expect with that, with that thing as they refuse the procedure. And many ER docs are very comfortable, they go, oh, patient refuses procedure. And so a lot of these ones that end up at the neurosurgical office now having this disaster are when the ER uh, doc has presented a really warped discussion with the patient who now refuses. And so, so it says, so we, just two I think we, we all agree about this. I, this panel, I'm sure Rick does as well, that uh, as an LP is the definitive test, a CT yep. Is I believe it's far worse than what's published uh, for sentinel leaks, which is the only one you're worried about. The person who comes in and has a plus four and is lying on the ground, you don't need anything to know that he's bleeding in his brain. The one that we're worried about is the sentinel leak. That's the one where CT, for the reason that these guys have just said, spectrum bias, that's the one you miss it on. I just want to take one little further extension. I don't really care which approach you use, whether you do CP, CT and then LP, 
or just LP alone. Although I do think there's a reason we should just do LP alone. We should go right to LP, not do the CT first. And let me just explain it to you. So if CT is good if it's positive, you're done. Okay, that's fine. But it's not good if it's negative. You have to do an LP. So you say to yourself, well, at least I'll save some LPs if I do the CT first. You, and if you actually think about it, you don't really do that. Why? Because you really are doing this test on 20 headaches for everyone who's got it. Right? It's high risk, but they probably don't. At least 10, maybe 20 for everyone who's got it. That means that 19 out of 20, the CT is going to be negative, which means you have to do the LP anyway. So at the very mer most, you're saving 1 out of 20 LPs. You're not saving a lot of LPs. And then, of course, what actually happens is what Billy just said, which is it's only natural that you, you did the test, the, the CT is negative, I'm feeling a little better, doc, I don't really want that, and you end up doing the wrong thing, the only thing that is not acceptable, which is CTLP, hold the LP. Which is what's <laughs> happening in real practice. There's, there's, there's and and all questions. of us are seeing, uh, the, there's three. we're all seeing lawsuits about this. There's three questions, the, Dr. Willard, and then the, at the back there, and then up here. What I was going to say is, at the hospital where I practice in Pasadena, I think that it's getting to the point now where the only physicians who can do a lumbar puncture at the bedside are the emergency doctors. The yeah. admitting hospitalists don't do them, they send them off to Can our residents do them? That's yeah. what we want to know. Some of the neurologists don't even seem to do them, so it's sort of incumbent on us to <laughs> aggressively address this in that small subsegment of patients and people always accuse me of being anti-test. Are there any tests you like? You know, LP. I'm it's a, a really good test because it answers the question that I'm asking. That's why I like it. But I, I'm wondering if other, other areas where people practice that's becoming a situation where you, you, everybody else seems to need the interventional radiologist to do this. Are you guys experiencing yeah. that as well? We got the flu thing, the same thing. Like our microbiologist. Uh, yeah, it's, it's yeah. just... We're the last <laughs> procedure-oriented person in the hospital anymore. I mean, even surgeons don't operate. The trauma surgeons don't operate on anyone anymore. <laughs> do you still have a question in the back? Um, yeah, when you do the LP, um, in my lab, they don't typically track your venous pneumonia. How, how important is that? I mean, are you just looking for a you're, You know what you're looking... I, this, I don't want to open a huge can of worms and talk in great detail, but I would be brief and tell you you're looking for red blood cells. Okay, uh, the xanthochromia issue is... a. Uh, is uh, overstated, I think, is, a, is, yeah. a, is important. Most occasionally, you're, you're going to do most of these within the first uh, hours. There's a days. really rare person where the red blood cells, mm, you're not sure, and the and xanthochromia helps you. It's extremely rare. That's so the, I think yeah. I the think one last Stuart's thing right I say that is that the sensitivity of a and if you've pl plain old LP at any time, even an hour afterwards, is 99.99. Right. That's good enough. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what if I get a, you know, a, a, a tap that's early. no good? Uh, no, I mean, he's thinking I get a, a tap that's no good tap. and I've got a bloody tap. Okay, the answer to that question is repeat it at a different interspace and get better data. Because all this business about, oh, it went from 800 to 400 or it went from 8,000 to 6,000, I can make, that's all garbage. Right, there's some, and we've just published a couple of papers about that specific issue, illuminating the fact that many people with decreasing amounts of red blood cells can, in fact, have subarachnoid hemorrhage. If you have significant numbers of red cells, in the CSF, you haven't ruled it out. And that's because you can have, for example, you can go in there and get an epidural vein or whatever, but you can still have a subarachnoid in the CSF on top of that. Tap. So decreasing numbers don't necessarily mean anything. Repeat it at a better interspace, or if a junior person has done it, get someone more senior to do it, or get, you know, and that's the, that's the basic Or get answer. someone more junior to do or it, get still some, knows how. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Or the other thing is that, that comes up is you got 300 red cells on tube one and, and 290 on tube two, and the neurosurgeon says, well, it's decreasing a little bit, and the numbers are too low to be a subarachnoid. Whoop, whoop, danger. There are all kinds of subarachnoids with cell counts down in the low What's hundreds. the third one? There's a third, you do have a third? Uh, well, uh, so if you go the LP route first, there's no, is there any studies or anything? We know that guaranteed if you have subarachnoids, there is blood in Pasadena. Yeah, that's yeah. what we're saying. Yeah. We're saying so that LP is, we're saying it's, that it's, it's one of the only tests in medicine. It's close to 100%. There are, there are two, uh, two or three case reports of somebody who had a negative LP where they thought, in retrospect, that maybe it wasn't bleeding, but, but it was an aneurysm that was expanding. Right. That's different. But, yeah. but, you know, basically, this is about as close as you can get. There is always going to be the patient you're 100% certain. I knew beforehand, 
and the data is a little bit off and I want to get more information, that's fine. There are some people that get admitted anyway because I'm so worried about them and then they do an angiogram and blah, blah, blah. But for the most part, yes, it, it's definitive. And the other reason, why do we do a CT first? We do a CT because the LP is so dangerous. Those of us who used to practice when the LP wasn't so dangerous know that that's baloney. And in fact, the only play, the only potential risk from an LP, and this is, I say potential because there really isn't evidence that it ever happens, the only potential risk is the patient who is very altered mental status and or has focal neurologic findings. It's a different patient than one you're tapping. You don't need to do a CT before you do an LP. And that's important. There was a very misleading paper in the New England Journal a few years ago by Hasbun uh, that sort of was all about this whole issue of, uh, of, of uh, what would predict a normal CT. The point isn't what will predict a normal CT. The point is what will predict herniation. And what predicts herniation is exactly what Jerry said, which is altered mental status, focal findings, or, and or papilledema is the other and, thing to And add even on that. those, and the, the evidence of herniation in those, although everybody has an urban myth story about, oh, they yeah. did the LP and the person herniated, the evidence, there's a lot of stuff we could talk about, but the, the, the little quick and dirty about it is the evidence is that in neurosurgical patients with known brain tumors who are tapped, a very small percentage of them herniate within 12 hours. The and those are mostly, they got the tap because they were herniating. The honorable member from New South Wales. There is no, it's not Victoria, dangerous. from Victoria. We've had And they need to publish them because my, I agree with what Jerry says that this is exceedingly rare. We, in fact, we've had a couple of cases brought to us over the years where they implied that this, the LP caused the herniation. In our review, it was not true. They were like, they were like Jerry said. I Those cases are, are the best stories I've ever heard for it. My counter to the published literature on the topic is people aren't really actually anxious to tell you about the kid they killed yesterday in the ER. And so the fact that they're not in the literature may not mean that they never happen. And so when I hear these kinds of stories from people, I'm like, you write that thing up. I've heard many, many people say, I saw it. And then when you actually ask, it's not that they saw it, they heard about it from somebody else, and they heard about it from somebody else. The truth is, there is no evidence anywhere of it. Now, does that mean it's impossible? Of course not. But it's exquisitely unlikely. And if it really happened, which and if you saw it in front of your own eyes, um, that's way beyond the pale of what uh, is known. Well, I can only tell you that it, Publish. it, it, would, it would be a, an inquest because it's never happened anywhere else. Use a small needle when you're doing an LP, like a it 22 really gauge. You cannot find, if you look at the quote evidence, it's almost all from this one neurosurgeon who is doing taps because he, known brain tumor, signs of elevated intracranial pressure to relieve the pressure. And, but also and, 60 cc's all of those, off a And all of those were within 12 hours they got worse in people who were getting worse. So I'm not saying it, it's impossible, but it's exquisitely rare. The other thing I would say is, is that the old days of looking in a fundus and saying, you know, I don't know, papilledema, schmapilledema, did I really see it? If you don't have a panoptic in your emergency room, the, the little device, like the panoptic is one of those devices that as soon as it, as soon as it got into emergency rooms, it's like, oh, shit, there's the fundus. Um, so you can actually see them now, and so the panoptic, if you don't have one, is so worth having. It's a little, it's a little telescope thing that put, puts a little soft cup over your eye, a little soft cup over their eye, so none of the light is in there. People that cost a couple hundred bucks, and you can suddenly actually make retinal diagnoses, like, like retinal syphilis and retinal hypto, histo, P and retinal. P P a N. It's been around for just, five years. If six you years, just measure at, at IOP. I, measuring intraocular pressure correlates with intracranial pressure. Which I think, although there's only one paper that talks two. about this, or two now, that IOP, so you do a dip, 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 dip with your tono pen, and it's high in someone who don't have, doesn't have eye pathology, that that's an indicator of elevated intracranial pressure. 
I think this is a fascinating thing. At our hospital, we see lots of neurocystic sarcosis with obstructive hydrocephalus. We see uh, uh, other causes, you know, shunt failures with obstructive hydrocephalus. Um, and so we have a lot of those. And so the concept uh, that I can get to their, um, I, their intracranial pressure indirectly with an IOP is fascinating to me, but it's not mainstream and it's not been done in any particular clinical setting yet. So I think we need to know more about it, but I'm very, very you interested in this. There are two that I know. There are two. two. Yeah. Uh, the, the other oh, thing that I find interesting about I, I is, think is one was not. I'll look. If you oh, see the, the, the young girl who weighs 350 pounds on birth one control pills and minocycline with a headache, and you're thinking she has idiopathic intracranial hypertension, and so then you have to roll Shamu over to get the LP, and you can't do the LP. Um, I'm sensitive to this, as you can tell. Um, you know, that LP is, is a challenging LP, to say the least. It would be, you know, on the eye and you get a 50. I'm pretty much done. She's got um, idiopathic uh, intracranial hypertension. But you can You guys can, can use the Shiat's tenometer. Right? Yeah, I can't, I can't fix them. But the, uh, the, the, there's another debate about how to fix them, right? The current, the current belief about how to fix idiopathic intracranial hypertension is to do LPs. Most of us who actually have been following this literature, and I've been following it pretty closely, don't think that's the answer. There is no such thing as idiopathic intracranial hypertension. You're hearing it here first. All idiopathic intracranial hypertension is sagittal sinus and other sinus thrombosis. The treatment for idiopathic intracranial hypertension is anticoagulation. Um, we'll you get are there. hearing it first. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> right, you got to do an MRV. You got to do an MRV. But you can make them feel a lot better by taking off. Right, them. and it would be a shame. And it would you, be a, sh it, you it would be a shame if they went blind while you were deciding whether to anticoagulate them. Well, I it's also that. there's no evidence that anticoagulating them helps. Yeah, you can, this is a really interesting uh, conversation. We're uh, we're on the between, fringe there. Between so our we, junior faculty and Jerry. We can come back service. to it, but we're on the fringe. I would <laughs> acknowledge. We, we purposely put Stewart in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I would hate for you guys to think I disagree with Jerry all the time. I almost never disagree with Absolutely. Jerry. Absolutely. Absolutely. We agree. We can Do agree you guys on that. Wanna, uh, I want to, we got any, uh, Rick, here? Rick, stop you talking wanna, so much. Yeah. Rick, you're hogging the so conversation, badly. Rick. I, I know I'm hogging the, uh, on your You show. Mike hog. <laughs> I haven't heard this one. Uh, how crazy is the Plavix study from China with 44,000 people and only two lost to follow? <laughs> 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 they were all prisoners. <laughs> I don't know this study. Yes, you do. Oh, yes, you do. It's the other part commit. of commit. Commit, commit. The other part of commit. 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 There's the yeah, commit. Yeah, yeah. Commit That's right. But then, by yeah. the way, the planet didn't yeah, work. Right. It only lost two people to the following. Right. Well, yeah, no, it, does that surprise you? If they couldn't find Mr. Wong. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> they, what they didn't tell you is that five, 500 of them were executed. <laughs> yeah, they <laughs> followed up the, on them through their... You're not the same, Mr. Wong, but it's okay. It's so much easier to keep follow-up on them when you're following all of their computer transmissions. So, you know, so they knew exactly where they were, what they were doing. So there is a yes. Yeah, so there's there's a there's, a, there's a, a, a another another question, very very similar. Yeah, of course you're right. And uh, there's another question very similar. Um, the concept of aspirin resistance is this another drug industry myth to promote bleedix or plavix as as it might be uh, called. And so you know there there's really good evidence um, that aspirin is useful for uh, cardiovascular, cerebrovascular disease. It's not fabulously good, it's good. One out of every 100 people will do better by almost every sort of measure you can come up Men with. Men and women? Men and women, everything. Um, it, you know, you can slice and dice, but it's really, really good stuff. And Cheap, um, And it's cheap and it's safe. And the reason it's good is because it's safe. Because if it weren't safe, for all the reasons we said, you'd have balancing harm for benefit. But it turns out it's so safe in these low doses that it actually does well. Nevertheless, it doesn't fix everything. And guess what? There are some people who still deteriorate. So then the question is, once you've deteriorated on aspirin, you've had an event. You had your new TIA, your new stroke. You're already on aspirin. What should you do? And there, there's very poor evidence. But the evidence, as far as I can tell, is as follows. Um, there is a benefit in the little studies that have added the old guy. What's the old guy? Teclopidine. Not teclopidine. It's the other one. Tetrapyridamol. Which? Tetrapyridamol. Tetrapyridamol. Thank you. That's right. Tetrapyridamol. And that evidence is pretty good, but it was done so small 
that it wasn't statistically significant, so it's been basically ignored. But you don't like the ticlopidine one? There's it's a mostly good. The ticlopidine yeah. is mostly very marginal at best. And the evidence, I don't think the evidence is any good, but if anything, it's better for the diperidamol, which nobody's using because it doesn't soft cost anything. Because it's soft patent. Soft patent. Yeah. And, um, and then for, for clopidogrel, that's the worst evidence of all for any added benefit. So if, so maybe in somebody who's already on aspirin and then has an event, maybe there would be some advantage to using some different one. But it's, I think it's mostly a maybe, and it's probably, and certainly the best evidence is for the oldest, cheapest guy. But I, I don't know, I don't know what the answer is. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there were some marginal benefit, but it ain't very good. And then you add, why is it more likely to be true of diperidamol than clopidogrel? Because clopidogrel has more side effects. All right, Billy. Yeah, so the loading 300 thing, was a loading. They the were loading dose. And be careful um, because you, if you talk to any of your cardiothoracic, uh, now the incidence of someone going from a, from a PCI to bypass is now low. But if there's any chance of that happening, your cardiac surgeons, if you talk to you say you put them on Plavix, they're like, hell no, they're, I'm not taking the OR. I don't care what happened. You, called, you caused pericardial tamponade because you ruptured a vessel. I'm not going. Far more important than the STEMI, which is this little tiny thing where I really don't, know the answer, but I don't, they could do whatever they want. They want to start on Plavix, that's fine with me. It may have marginal benefit. But much more important is all the non-STEMIs that you're seeing that are not having an intervention where you have to make a decision. And there it's quite clear that except in the very highest risk, those who have a troponin leak and or ST, acute, serious, real ST depression that they never had before, it is not beneficial. And in fact, the, the study that proved that is the CURE, cure study. Trial. Yeah. And the CURE study was, has lots and lots of problems. In fact, we did a, 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 a review of the CURE, a critique of it called CURE is not a cure for ACS. And it went through a lot of the ways in which the CURE trial cheated. Cheated over and over. Really cheated. But, but aside from that, the nice part that, that CURE showed was it was a study where they took all these people who came in with chest pain and they re randomized them to clopidogrel or not. And 2,500 patients into it, they changed the rules. And they changed the rules because it wasn't working. And it was causing complications. So how did they change the rules? They said, it no, it's no longer rule out ACS. It's now you got to have the disease. You have to have a troponin leak or ST depression. And in that group, they found some benefit. It was a small benefit, but they found benefit. Again, that makes a lot of sense. If you're giving it to a lot of patients who actually don't have the disease, you're not going to help them, but you're going to hurt some of them. And so as many as you hurt, that'll get rid of the benefit you got in the people who are benefiting. So if you actually limit it to a very small sub segment, the ones who are really high risk because they're actually having the disease, there is some marginal benefit. But it isn't good in all those other patients with rule out ACS, in the all commas with rule out ACS, because most of them don't have it and you're gonna hurt enough that you're gonna actually cause overall harm. And the other thing that you should keep your eye out for with Plavix, so people end up now on Plavix for a variety of reasons, whether it's evidence-based or not, you're, you're seeing increased numbers of people who are on it. And so they, then they get taken off of it because their urologist the wants to do a TERP. You know, so they were on it, and now they're stroked out. So there's this rebound thrombo, but bleedix, you're damned if you do, you bleed if you're on it, it causes lots of hemorrhagic con uh, complications. And, and they won't do it, surgery. No, none of the surgeons <laughs> no, will do not surgery. Not even a TERP. But not now when you take it off it, then ooh, you take it off yeah. them and they stroke and they come in with chest pain. So you'll see these people even missing a couple of days. Oh, I ran out and I figured I'd get it fixed. Then, and here's what you'll hear. And then my insurance company said I had to go through, jump through these 19 hoops to get it, right? That's why they say, we'll help you get it in the ads, the direct against, if you can't. So you'll see these people, they go off it for four days, then they come in with either a, uh, an anginal presentation or a stroke. So bleedix to me is a, it's both bleedix and clodix. It's a real problem. You, you can't stop it. And once you start it, it's your, your corner. And cornering therapies are bad. But it's making several billion dollars a year five, now. Over so five it's, billion, over you can five bank billion last year. You can bank It's on. up there with Lipitor. Yeah, the yeah, billions. Two are commonly prescribed drugs in there. Number one and two, I think it's something like eight. Eight, Lip yeah. Lipitor, Lipitor is, is the biggest one. seller in the world. That's like $12 billion yeah. a year. In the US, it was like seven or some, seven and change billion. 
No, and Plavix is over, no. Plavix over five billion. <laughs> no, NZs are in quantity. And direct, do we need direct to consumer advertising for a drug with this kind of problems? It's on the TV all the time. For what doctors call ACS. For what doctors call ACS. <laughs> So do another question, Billy. All right, this guy, th this person asked two other good questions, um, and I think we can dispense with them quickly. Do we need contrast on CT to diagnose appy in the age of advanced helical CT? We've done a whole chapter on this. Uh, I think next year and a year before. Yeah. I think the answer is no. The problem is you can't get your radiologist to believe the answer. And so the literature strongly suggests that a CT has gotten better, that the unenhanced CT is adequate for the diagnosis of appy. You just can't get your radiologist to ante up. Go ahead. Yeah, we are. <laughs> what time is it in the... We really, only need, we really only need 24 radiologists for the world. One for each time zone. And, and they can no, be 25, one for Newfoundland. Uh, yeah, one for Newfoundland <laughs> that's on the, that reads the scans on a half hour difference. <laughs> and, then, and, yeah. and, and that way, um, that wide awake radiologist can read all the scans so, uh, for that time, you know, for the, for the world uh, during that hour of Okay, week. next, do it. Okay, uh, pre-hospital, oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, those of you who are on the uh, listserv for the uh, ED Directors Academy, I've been putting out our chapter from two years ago. For those of you who want the ammo to give to your radiologist. To say you don't need to do this? To say, it says you don't need to do it. There's a whole cluster of papers about appendicitis and the non necessity for contrast, and also in the setting of uh, contrast uh, of trauma, the necessity. So if you want, uh, like a copy of that, just give me an email, and uh, I'll send it to you if you're, if you're wrestling. And it's an ugly thing, right? We used to say you don't want to pass on patients because passed on patients represent 15% of the total volume, but 25% of the malpractice. Now there's this new super evil pass on, which is your radiologist want this NPO patient to drink three quarts yeah. over three hours. They're NPO for surgery, of course, but they're drinking three quarts of contrast. <laughs> then they got to go. Then you got to get the thing red. So now the the, the night doc has the liberty the... Of, of killing the morning doc. Unless you do the yeah, there's the I got four pass ons patient. for you. Yeah. <laughs> Ouch. What are they? They're all belly pain scans in progress. It's like, oh, Jesus. What a way to start your day yeah. with four complex abdominal pain pass-ons with a partial study waiting for a reading or an abdominal CT to be done. It's bad. Yeah, we have all of these papers comparing uh, CTs now versus we didn't do CTs before. How, are we doing better in appendicitis? And every one of those papers say yeah. you're adding two, three hours. Yeah, so the, we're not doing any what, better. I'll just say one thing about it. So if you look at CT and ultrasound for diagnosed appendicitis, they weren't being done regularly in, 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 you know, before 85. They are being done regularly. There are these huge national registries. If these things are really helping us, then there should be a decreased perf rate, decreased negative lap rate. We should be doing better. And in fact, the perf rate is going up. Why? Because some of them are perfing while you're getting this five-hour procedure done. The imaging they needed was the retina of a surgeon, and the imaging they got was three quarts of contrast in a five-hour delay. Okay, pre-hospital, absolutely, absolutely correct. Pre-hospital RSI by paramedics. Controversy over benefits, risk, and errors. Are there any studies evaluating the above along with outcomes? Okay. Well, it so happens that there, there are. Uh, and the biggest study is the one that was done in San Diego County. It's in the trauma, pre-hospital trauma and, section. Uh, and it, uh, it's, it, it was done in San Diego and also in Orange County. That, for you guys that aren't from here, is what we call beyond the orange curtain, which means everything south of here down to Mexico. And in that area, they did a very big study that when they initially published their results, were published as a success story, saying, look, we've given paralytics to these medics using a product. Or in head these, trauma. To, uh, in head trauma to these, uh, uh, to these uh, medics. And in the now field. they don't hurt the patients because they're uh, paralyzed. And now, uh, <laughs> and now they're, they're much calmer when they arrive. <laughs> But uh, it was initially touted as a big success. Look, we intubated most of them. I think it was 86% of them. You know, there was a, quite a few they had to put uh, uh, LMAs in, and there was a crike in there or two. But uh, they touted it as a success. But then as the data started to come in, uh, most notably, just to get to the bottom line, the mortality data, which showed a very significant increase in mortality of those patients, uh, it started to become apparent that we were doing harm to these patients And not the just field. the mortality data, the zero insight disorder data also came in. So the paramedics said they loved this, the paralytics. They thought it made their job much more easier and that these intubations were so much easier. And when they looked at the data about the intubations, the average DSAT was 22%. Now, you guys all know that 78% isn't a B in oxygenation. So if they started at 100%, they ended at 78%. If that was the of the and, and a huge number of them, like 50% of them DSATed, and the average DSAT was 22%. 
bradycardias, all, you know, so the whole goal in head injury, you can, without doing injury prevention, you can't prevent the primary injury, right? You have to get them off the Kawasaki to prevent the primary injury, you know, put a guardrail in, things like that. But once they have a head injury, the whole goal of emergency care is to prevent secondary brain injury. And the two major causes of secondary brain injury are hypoxia and hypotension. And they caused both with high frequency, and they thought it was great. And another one of the big it's problems. Great. Another We're one doing of the big great. problems. No, you're killing them. A lot of, another one of the big problems was with the PCO2, which when they started yeah. measuring, they found out that was a big issue as well. Needless to say, the study was discontinued because it was found to be doing harm. Um, it was comparing against historical controls, which were before they gave them the, the, uh, the paralytics. And that was the biggest, best controlled study to date on the subject. And we haven't seen anything to repeat that subsequently. And having said that, just one, and one more caveat, is having said that, that's a large urban system with many different stations and it's a very complex system. There is evidence that in small circumscribed systems like Aeroflight, with uh, specially trained medics and nurses, That's different stuff. and in small, in small, better controlled uh, uh, um, environments where the people have more experience and are doing this more often, there is some uh, papers that are yeah. small that show that I it might be successful. So to we don't want to shut that all down. Paramedics on we, so we had a whole talk yesterday about pre-hospital oh. stuff and, and including intubation. And again, uh, probably it's not one size fits all. If you're going to be out in the field for four hours, it's probably reasonable to learn the skills to do it. The problem is the places where they're going to be in the field for four hours, they very rarely have the resources to get anybody to be trained, and they certainly don't have the experience to do it over and over and over again. So there's a separate problem if you're out in Idaho, and you, there probably you need to send a doctor with it. And the ones where we have lots of paramedics, um, those are the ones where there is no evidence that intubating in the field is better because you can get them to the hospital in 20 minutes, and that's much smarter. Paramedic, RSI, urban setting, no. Anyway, let, go ahead. I personally, I think that makes a lot more sense. Although I will say that I don't, I'm not, I don't have experience there, and I think if you could get a place where you can, in very limited numbers, in those really tricky ones, you could get a doctor out there to do it. It's not that doctors are magic. I mean, paramedics have lots of skills. The problem is it's a very tough environment, and they're not doing it very often. But if you could get somebody out there where you can make a reason why you think intubation is really important because it's going to be a long time, I have no problem with that, but I, I think intermediate solutions are much smarter. In the San Diego study, 86%, I think, were intubated endotracheally um, in the conventional way, and then 13%, I believe, were intubated with combi tube, and I think it was 1% or so cripes. And there's so lots of combi tube Combi tube was the, main, was the main backup in the San Diego Paramedics study. Paramedics like combi tubes better than LMA because they stay in better. And the secret of both the combi tube and the LMA is you don't have to choose which hole to put it in. If you know where their mouth is, you know where it goes. And so you can't go, in, unless you don't put it in their mouth, you can't have it in the wrong hole. And the, the, the incidence of paramedics So what was the, the incidence of it being in the wrong hole? <laughs> well, I don't know. It should be zero. <laughs> I have seen a combi tube <laughs> hanging out someone's rectum. Uh, but, uh, you know, anyway, That's the, combi different, tube, the combi tube and the LMA go into one space and they're all right. But the errors of intubation by paramedics was also reviewed, and it's higher than anyone wants to talk. Yeah, we talked about it. going into the field. The machines are portable and for COPD ears with 20 minute transport times. There are lots of people saying in terms of the feasibility studies of BiPAP and CPAP in the field, they're done. It's quite feasible. In terms of outcome studies, were there meaningful changes in outcome? Do, does this make a difference? No studies have addressed that. But in terms of feasibility, it's quite feasible and several systems are doing it. You know, I always worry about is what, how much overdoing are we going to do? Is there going to be harm? So again, in an urban system where it's going to be 10, 15 minutes, hard for me to imagine it's really important. But it, it is right. feasible. Not. We don't know important. But but here's, yeah, there are right. a couple of questions about TPA for stroke. And then there's one question which we have to end on, which is, this is a great one, about is there anything that we agree on? <laughs> <laughs> is that what it says? Well, no, it's actually it's such a great question. List, <laughs> have each presenter list 10 therapeutic diagnostic points they really support. 10, Ed. How about one? <laughs> <laughs>
and that is um, the iconoclast list of things they really believe in. And no one on, can list something someone else really believes in. <laughs> the, the whole course has been devoted to being controversial. The question asked the presenters where they think controversy has actually ended. So we, we have to get to back to that one in a second. But first, let me just uh, DPA question. for stroke, where I think we all agree the controversy is over, but um, with a, 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 with a no, contrarian view a contrarian, viewpoint. A contrarian viewpoint. So what is this cu current thing on TPA for stroke? Is there more information, et cetera? So the quick and dirty is there are no new trials, OK? There are now eight, I believe, fairly large randomized trials, of which one was positive. That was the NINS trial. All the others were either neutral or negative by their own terms. Now, they've been sort of sliced and diced in retrospect to say, well, yes, they were. It was harmful. But if you look at people who were born on a Tuesday, it was really good. Um, but yeah, there are eight trials, one positive. There are also, those are efficacy studies. What happens under the best possible conditions with experts in a trial? And there are also effectiveness studies, which is we don't do a placebo control, we just see what happened. We did it in the community, what happened? And the large majority of effectiveness studies, the big ones from North America, are pretty horrifying. They're not. Um, they don't, you can't compare it to placebo. There is no placebo, but they look at how many people did what, and the outcomes are terrible compared to historic controls, compared to what we thought they would have done when they first came out. So um, that's most of the new data is effectiveness. Now, there is one effectiveness study that says just the opposite. We did it. It was great. There are a few like that, but they're really silly. The, the one that you may have heard of, it's gotten a lot of attention, it's called the SITSMO study. It was done in Europe. It was published last year in The Lancet. The Lancet comes in the, the US version. You get, this is what the cover looks like, with the ex except that it's white, and that it says The Lancet on top. But otherwise, it's blank, except for one sentence. And the one sentence of that issue says, TPA is both safe and effective in community hands. That's pretty impressive, because you know it's really powerful. It's the only thing you read. So the SITSMO study, I'll just tell you about it very, very quickly. 6,000, something like that, patients who got TPA in Europe. And their results, they compared them to the results in NINS and uh, cherry-picked other uh, patients from other studies. And they said, we did just as well as in NINS. The outcomes were just as good. The bleeding was less. Everything was great. We can do it just as well. And by the way, this was throughout Europe, including Slovenia and Azerbaijan. And, I mean, it was, and these are hospitals that had never actually had an ICU before. And yet, we were able to do it with these great results. So it, was, it has been touted as showing that in community hands, it will do great just like it did in NINS. Um, it's, it's an, almost an embarrassment. I mean, it is an embarrassment in some ways. So let me just tell you some things about this SITSMO study. The first was, how did they know what the outcomes were? The 90-day outcomes were really good. How did they know? Well, they actually examined the patient. Or they called the patient. Or they called a family member. Or they called a doctor. Who knew the patient. Or they sent a telegram. Or a letter reply form. They don't tell us how many of each of these there were. That's what they say. It was blah, 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 or letter reply form. So it wasn't like they actually found out how the patient did. Oh, how many, wait, how many patients did they include? Was it everybody who got TPA? Well, actually, we encouraged hospitals to tell us if they gave TPA. We don't know how many they gave and didn't tell us about. These are only the ones that they told us about. That's not the bad part. The bad part is as follows. We did just as well as they did. In NINS. In NINS, it was everybody who had a stroke. It was mild stroke, moderate stroke, severe stroke. Mild stroke, you do really well. Moderate stroke, you do fair. Severe stroke, you do terribly. NINS is all the strokes. In SITSMOST, it was only mild strokes. We did just as well with the paronychia as they did with all infections, including sepsis and meningitis. Didn't we do well? It was only mild strokes. That's not the worst of it. The worst of it, this is unbelievable that this was published in Lancet. In the paper itself, it doesn't say this. But in the accompanying editorial, which says, wow, isn't this great, by a famous pro-TPA guy in America, in the editorial, he says, you know what the best thing about the SITSMO study was? 
they systematically excluded all protocol violations. That means, you know those X Games feats that you see? Don't try this at home. Wait a second. We tried it at home, and we did great every time we didn't crash. We didn't count the times we crashed. It's unbelievable that this is published as a positive study. Now, the good news is I have the NINS data, finally. And so I've <laughs> been trying really hard to get one of the major journals to look at a paper I wrote from this. And it's fascinatingly, they, several of them have refused to review it with no explanation. They just, we don't want it, we're not going to look. Do not show it to us. Um, but what we've shown, I've shown it to Billy and Stuart at, at, um, at LA County, and I've shown it some other places. And it basically, if you actually look at the NINS data, I think NINS, the only study that was positive, I think I can convince you once we get this paper in print, which we're really trying hard to do, I, I believe it pretty clearly shows that there was no difference between the TPA and placebo group, that all of the difference was based on that placebo patients had worse stroke. And Jerry's being, being very cautious that he can, he, when he says, I think I can convince you, I mean, there's absolute, I mean, the, you don't even need any written words around it. All he needs to do is show you the Kaplan-Meier curves and the graphs, and you'll just go, you they're the, the same. The, the different groups are, are indistinguishable. And, but the other nice part about this is that you looking at the NINS data, I, since I have it, I can compare SITSMOS to the people who had the same quality stroke in NINS. And there, the SITSMOS paper, people did far, 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 far worse than the people who had a small stroke and got, and got TPA. But you know what else? They did far, far worse than the people who had a small stroke and got, and got placebo. Because the people who got TPA and placebo got the same results. So, it's, so I believe, hopefully, this, when it's printed, it is so dramatic when you look at it. I never expected this. When you look at it, it's so indistinguishable to different groups that hopefully this will, it will have some effect. And the, the companion question was, you know, wh who's behind all these stroke centers and being pushed for all this stuff? And of course, guess who's behind it? Um, will it change? I don't know if it will change. I'm hopeful that when you see this, that it'll be really hard to keep pushing it. Now, Rick and I did a paper today. We're doing a, a, a paper today looking at stroke centers, which says, you know what? Stroke centers do really well. And why do they do really well? Because they do prevent studies. pneumonia by, pr by doing swallowing studies and turning patients. Because they prevent the cubidi by turning the patients. Because they prevent the terrible effects of fever on metabolic demands in the brain by giving Tylenol. Foley catheters. They don't put in Foley's in the stroke centers Foley compared to... They get good ambulation. They get good PT. None of it is has to do with medicine or expertise. It's all nursing and rehab. Stroke is a disease of rehab, not a disease of emergent so intervention. So it's better if you, uh, if they have a regional... Uh, or prevention. It's a disease are, of prevention, too. It has to be taken to the closest hospital so that the three hours runs out and then to get taken over to the stroke center. You want to go to the stroke center tomorrow, not today. <laughs> One, two, three. I, I'm going to have to, I could, and I have done that with some people, I'm going to ask you to wait until it comes out. I actually, this is a phenomenal story. <laughs> the story is so good. Yes, but he'd have to kill you. Yeah, he'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> the story is really frightening. I'll tell, you that, you, read. <laughs> I'll tell you that after the BMJ and JAMA refused to look at it, refused to review it, they, we are not going to look, I sent it to Science Magazine. And Science Magazine, and I sent them a letter, cover letter saying, I really hope you'll consider because, you know, and I, this is so political that, um, but it was really important. Here's the reason why it's really important. It really has to do with science and the distortion of science, rather. This is a paper that I wrote with Dave Schreiger, and I, it's as good, I think, methodologically as anything I've ever done. It's really, really careful, and we don't, we don't tell you what to think. We just show you the data. And I was hoping that science would publish it, because that would have some clout, 
But I also was afraid they would say, no, it's, it's medicine. medicine. So I got back a week later, a, a letter which said, it's really interesting, but it's, it's medicine. It really belongs in a medical journal. And I was disappointed, but I thought, OK, well, I guess that's not weird. But it turned out it was weird, because the next day I got a call from a reporter from Science Magazine. And she called me up and she said, you know, this is really weird, but I got a call from my editor who said, you have to call this guy and do a news story on this fascinating stuff that he has. We're not publishing it, but it's, we need to really do a news story on it. And I thought to myself, that's sort of bizarre. It's not important. To, it, it, they can't publish it because it's not of interest to their readers. But it's of so much interest that they're going to do a news story on it. So I said this to her, and she said, she said, no, 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 the two are really separate. And I said, but, but why would it be that, they, that your readers have to know about it if it's not important for them to know about it? And she said, hmm, you know, that really is strange. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where it stands right now. It, we are hoping to have it published. And once it's published, there will be a new story in science about <laughs> so important that their readers so have to know about it. Well, I was. There's, there's always the New Brunswick journals. Uh, there, the yeah, I, <laughs> we're going to put it, publish it in the in-house YMCA journal. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's sad. It really. Uh, hopefully, it will be published soon. We're waiting to hear. It's going to be in the next Norton anthology and one research paper. But you know, it's too bad that science, even science. I mean, it's they didn't review it. They didn't reject it. They just said we. You know, it's not. We're not going to review it. And it's it's quite obvious. The, the reason had nothing to do, you know, they obviously are interested in it. I just, it's, it's sad. It's really sad. Even science is saying, <laughs> we're, have, not, we're have, not gonna publish I that. I take a little bit of heart. The stroke guys that, uh, that I work with at our place, they seem to have a resignation every time, you know, we get an acute stroke. They're like, geez, I wish we could come up with something that works. I mean, they, they're even, there seems to be some sort of silent resignation. Work. That's He's the being charitable. They're work. still nuts. They came, they came down the other day for a patient with a stroke. And they, they were getting ready to TPA, or we had to scan and everything, and they were like, well, I said, have you talked to them? Have you consented to them? Oh, this is FDA approved. We don't need consent. I was like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> Draining an abscess is FDA approved, but I asked the patient before I shove a knife in them, and they're never going to die from an IND. Yeah. I mean, I think you should tell them that there is some chance that there could be a slight problem like death, and that they should be informed about the choice you're making. Oh, no, it's a, and I, I said, out. Out, send your attending now. That's the fellow, the stroke fellow. These people they, that Stuart Fellow are reasonable. They know They're it. Psychic. They know it doesn't. They know that. I have, a I they have, know. I have moles in the neurology department at UCLA. I mean, I have all these people who I don't go to them, but they come up to me, you know, because because they're they've psycho. heard me talk, and and there are many of them who think, who roll their eyes, and they come and they say, "We killed another one yesterday." <laughs> Go ahead. Calling the herd. Go ahead. Just at, at a uh, Mayo Clinic uh, CME course uh, a few years ago in, in uh, Scottsdale, I was told that the, the numbers are if you give TPA to somebody with a moderate stroke, 80% of the time it does nothing whatsoever. 16% of the time it reverses the stroke where, where it wouldn't have been reversed otherwise, and 4% over what they would, over, over the uh, non treated death rate, they kill people. So That's a lie. It's, it's just a lie. I have the NINDS data. If you compare apples to apples, if you compare the moderate strokes to the moderate strokes, there's no difference. If you compare the severe strokes to the severe strokes, there's no difference. You've got to see the If curves. you compare the, the, the mild strokes to the mild strokes, there's no difference. In NINDS, which again is the, the most positive study, of the only positive study, 19% of the placebo patients, 19% of the TPA patients had the mildest stroke possible. 4% of the placebo patients had the mildest stroke possible. 19, 4. The worst stroke, 38, 28% versus 18% in the opposite direction. Could that be the reason why there was a 13% better outcome in the, NINS, in, the, in the TPA group? There was more than a 13% difference before they got treated. So, so you believe the real numbers are no benefit Correct. overall and increased mortality. That's the real story. Yes. Correct. That's what I think is the that, numbers. Is that what you would counsel the patient? And I and I can also show you that um, that if you exclude, see, TP, the NIN study is really different than the other studies. And one of the biggest differences is 
All the other studies show big increase in mortality if you get TPA. Not increase in overall bad outcomes, but increase in mortality. Every study shows an increase in mortality. In NINs, 17% of the TPA patients died and 21% of the placebo patients died. Now, the, even the Heart Association and the NINs authors agree that that's by chance. It doesn't save lives. That was statistically not different. And everybody else says it increased mortality. Some of them say doubles mortality. So they're, they're willing to agree it's not it doesn't really save lives. It's just a few more patients. But the fascinating thing is, if you look at the graph, with, in all the patients, they're sort of a superimposed. If you, if you say, okay, it doesn't save lives, so let's just get rid of the dead patients. We're not going to look at them. We're only going to look at the ones who survived because these guys are all claiming that the benefit is in survivors, not in saving lives. So let's look at the survivors. If you do that, the graphs are shocking. There is absolutely no difference in the survivors. They're not worse. They're this, the survivors are the same. The survivors are identical. And again, what about the non-survivors? Well, every other study shows a significant increase in non-survival. But they're identical. They're superimposed. You cannot get a microscope and tell me which is different between them. Uh, Intraarterial TPA? Inter I don't know. I mean, there's two little. No, we don't know. I don't know that, but I do know that at UCLA, the where they do much, they, I do that with, with, at UCLA, where they do much better than intraarterial. They use these fancy devices Mercy, where they go in there Mercy and they pull out the out. clot, yeah. and they, every, they have. It's, I, I sometimes say they've never published their results. They have published things on it. They've published. We've done it a bunch of times, and we like it, and we own the patent. No, they don't tell you that, uh, and but they do, and. Um, and uh, sometimes we get the clot out. That's what they've published. But they've been doing it for 10 years now, and they have never once published outcome data. It's outrageous. Now, you think they, they probably just aren't following the outcome data. That's probably it. They don't know. They would publish how great it is if they only knew. Unfortunately, they, they haven't been tracking it. You think that's the case? I, I suspect they know the outcome data. They own the patent, he just said. <laughs> There's so little we can do for stroke patients. It's fabulous that, because we've seen the, pa I can tell you, I've seen him play Rachmaninoff after it. He had a stroke, and he's now dancing on Dancing with the Stars. Well, you have a few to have spectacular saves that maybe weren't spectacular to, saves because yeah, when you actually look at the placebo group, there's also a few spectacular saves because they had a TIA. He probably saved some, and they probably killed others, and it's probably true that if you could find out which one really get, should get it, it would be useful. But it's probably almost no one, so it's probably not useful. You have to feel some sense of empathy with these people. I mean, look at what they've been through over the past 35 years. I mean, the CT scan came out. That was horrible. And <laughs> it's now it's killing a, people. It used to now, be great. Now it's killing and, people. No, seriously. <laughs> no, but in, well, first it was showing For a that, first of it was showing yeah, that fifty percent of the time they were wrong when they were localizing the lesion, right? So the CT <laughs> was a big that was a big downer, right? Yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> and then nothing and then, like having now, the action. Right, now, now it's killing people. Now it's killing people. No, but it's a very, very, very frustrating line of inquiry. It's a very frustrating spe specialty of medicine. And look at the like neuroprotection. I mean, every single thing that you do. <coughs> this shows promise in animals. This shows promise in every They're single. Doing Great study. with Parkinson's disease, Stuart. Come on. It's a frustrating specialty. <laughs> That's and true. And we shouldn't be grud and it's it just let's have some. They would like to believe it works. They really would like they to. They want to help people, but it's, nothing's working out. It's very frustrating. You know, the guys are lost in the balloon and they come out of the fog and there's you know, a guy on the ground. They say, hey, where is this, are we? And there is says, this thing, the um, there is this other <laughs> drug that was published. <laughs> there was another study for <laughs> acute stroke called ANCROD or snake venom. Right. And they right. published the first study was published and it the numbers are just like those for TPA, except a little better. Compared to placebo, ANCRAD was at a little more effective than TPA was. The difference is, w there were a couple of differences between ANCRAD and TPA. One was, unlike TPA, there were no other studies showing that it didn't work. There was one positive study, one positive study, eight negative studies, no other studies. So the, so the FDA approved it, right? No, the FDA didn't approve it. The FDA said, one study, are you kidding? You have to do another study. 
show us that it works. So they did another study, a much larger study, and guess what? It was killing a lot of people. It didn't work. You've never heard about it again. So the difference is one positive study, one positive study, a little more positive. Bunch of negative studies, no negative studies. This one got approved. This one didn't get approved. This one's now dead because they repeated it and it was terrible. This one they've refused to repeat because it would be unethical to repeat it. We already know it works. And so there was one other difference. Millions of dollars behind this one and not behind this one. Yeah, this the one snake, didn't get the approved. The snake union was against the other one very much. You know. It's sad. This is really sad. I don't take pleasure in this. I wish TPA worked. It, I just don't think it does, and I think it hurts people. We've got two questions over here. When, when was the last study published, the one that you mentioned? About a year ago. A year ago. SITSMOST, S-I-T-S-M-O-S-T. I, I, I keep going back to recheck because it seems they, they can't get away with this. But there it is in black and white. They systematically excluded all protocol violations. Abby. They only included uh, NINDS score of 24 or less. Abby. You mean, how about in the ambulance? It's already been proven it doesn't work in the ER, and therefore, they have got, there's a $24 million grant? $16 million. $16 million, $16 million grant million. in Los Angeles right now to do it earlier. It's not going to work. ER. Why not uh, vitamin C? <laughs> <laughs> no, Paul, vitamin C. Vitamin C would be more justified. Had they asked Linus about, Pauling, we would have gone for it. How about it. snake venom? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's really yeah. sad. Uh, that's the what's, magnesium. that's the curiosity. I don't know how magnesium, uh, lobby. I don't know man. how magnesium got got famous because there isn't really any money behind it. The only good thing about it is that it, it at least won't cost a lot, <laughs> except for a million sixteen million dollars. Other than that, of our cost of our grant monies. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're no, don't don't. T that's one of our the few grants that we're participating in at, at our place. So don't don't touch that one. <laughs> yeah. That is the largest pre-hospital care study ever done. Fast mag, fast mag. I don't know, but no, but there are studies. So magnesium is the poster child for how it, we get it wrong with these small studies, as you well know in the cardiac literature. There were a series of little tiny studies showing that in ACS and in STEMI, it decreased mortality by over 50%, far better than anything else we have, including PCI, over 50%, way, way better. There wasn't one study like NINs. There were 13 yes. randomized control trials. The meta-analysis of them, over 2,500 patients, 58% relative decrease in mortality, fabulous. Then the limit two study was done because nobody was pushing this, but wow, this is great. So they did a, a sort of a mini trial, a mini mega trial, 2,500 patients. Wasn't that good, but it was 28% decrease in mortality. Holy cow. Because nobody was selling it, that still wasn't good enough. So they did a mega trial called ISIS-4. 50,000 patients. Mm, no benefit. A little bit of trend toward harm. It's been repeated 19 times now. Many, many little trials. We did it in four people, and it worked. It was still great. And then another mega trial, magic, it doesn't work. But it also demonstrates the important principle that, you know, many, many trials, like uh, the meta-analysis, meta meta uh, the quality uh, is not equivalent to a well-designed randomized control trial. So the, what's the, 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 the most important, the, the most important statement on this ever, the most important quotation is from this guy right here. Three about meta-analysis. Three second graders did not make a sixth grader. That's <laughs> 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 the take-home message here. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great, too. <laughs> Anything Source else? Translated. I'm translating into Canadian. So yeah. what, are these, <laughs> what are these things? One thing that you think is really important innovation that you, that you believe in. Um, rock v. Suck. Suck still wins. That's an innovation? Well, or in, you want innovation? I'll take that. That's good. How about yeah. you, Stuart? Oh, you know, I think, and I don't know what you think of this, but I think uh, non-invasive ventilation in COPD patients. Good. I'm there. You might disagree with that. We have to have full consensus on that? Nitroglycerin for... No, for, okay, uh, that's for, it. Okay. Nitroglycerin is the okay. treatment of congestive heart failure. Okay, I'll go over that. Not right. diuretics. That. We have to come up with 10 of these? I agree with that. Um, yeah, keep going. No, it was it. Low max for kidney stones. Agree. 
Yeah. 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 All in? Uh, I'm all in. <laughs> Come on, Ray. Right. You want cup? I like nitro for anal. Uh, what is that thing in the? Uh, yeah, yeah. In, in fistula in anal. Fistula in anal. That's yeah. a nitrate for fistula in anal. Yeah. <laughs> but not on the same patients. <laughs> CT scan is really good for head trauma. Great. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Not skull it films. Work, but it's CT not. scans. Yeah. <laughs> Therapeutically or diagnostically? In my entire 30 years of practicing, there is no question that that was the most important thing that changed was CT scan for head trauma. The, the terrible irony is that we're now going to be doing more harm than good with CT scan, the greatest advance that we've had in, in the last I'll do years. a little widget, the easy I.O. You that's, don't need to put central yeah, lines in. Yeah. 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 It's just so like NASCAR. They come in, they're dehydrated, they don't have even, and not It's just, just like NASCAR. <laughs> and not just that. Put them up just, on the jacks, give them four yeah. lines. Yeah. Not just that, for, for little kids. <laughs> little yeah. kids, with, I just put an I.O. in a kid yeah. who, was, who was quite sick in our department. They couldn't get a line in, and they tried. The, the peds nurse came down to me. The peds nurse specialist came to me and said, we can't get the line in. We put the I.O. Uh, we put the ultrasound I hope they didn't put the I.O. up there. We've got to review the procedure. We couldn't see it. We, uh, we found a little tiny vein here, couldn't get it in. I said, enough, put the I.O. in. Yeah. The next day I got a complaint from pediatrics. Why did you put an I.O. in this They're nuts. child? I said, I didn't answer it. We do, we do elderly people. We, we do, actually you know, these IV drug abusers with no line that, you know, you, you, they're... they're <laughs> the nice part about it is it's safe. It's not a big deal. It's, n it's, it's safe. Actually, we just did a paper looking at the pharmacokinetics. Did we do pharmacokinetics? Yeah. yeah. Of um, the compared intravenous versus IO morphine uh, in terms of uh, pharmacokinetics, identical, identical. Hmm. Yeah. But the most the important thing is thing it's is not dangerous. It's not like you're causing harm. And it doesn't hurt. You know, if you, if you could put a little wheel of local up, these you, you could you'll see on the videos when they do them on volunteer paramedics and their proximal humor. So just sit there. Boom. The only one thing I will say is we have uh, we have. We have a sort of a very diverse patient population, but we have one group that, if they're really furry, um, and I'm furry, uh, the, the only thing I will tell you is, is that the pain of an I.O. is mostly due to the plucking of the hairs that spin around it at the very end. So if you're going to put an I.O. in, just, just do a little razor action first, because that's what hurts. The I.O., you think going through the bone really hurts. The I.O. is actually, you know, with these easy I.O. guns where it's... They're where so easy. Whoop. They're wonderful, yeah. And Just the nice get, part, unlike the, the Jamshidi Nidhi where you yeah, really had to hurt yeah. the person, yeah. this, it goes right, and it, what's more, yeah. it doesn't go through the other it's side. Stop, it just stops because it has a, that... Because you can really feel great. it, and it's in. Go ahead. Yes. It's like yeah. a little, it's, it's like a little black and decker. It goes, it's whoop, and it's done. It's, the, it's, the most it's an air wrench in, in NASCAR it's terminology. It's beautiful. That's all it is. It's beautiful. And it's beautiful. Just put them up on jacks, throw four done? lines in, give them some new rubber. So you give them that, you give them non-invasive ventilation, put them on nitrates, and then some nitrates around for if the If you don't need four lines, we generally change the outside tires for the curve. So go for, you know, go for the... For the you know it's all left hand turn so go for the right side if it's if you're going to use NASCAR. What about, what about puffers for colds? What? What do you what can you give people of colds? So yeah, well, the thing the, is the, 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 the logic behind that is that you know how they wait five hours. You gotta give Instead them of giving them a damn antibiotics, even if my puffers are going Perfect. to work, I give them puffers. Yeah, I got I've it. I've been doing this so much. Like in people that are not necessarily feel the frustration. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is beautiful. It's raw. You have the paper, and, and maybe there's some. Raw there is a paper. There. There's we lots did a of paper on this. A couple. Of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, like, is there like saying that I shouldn't sure do it? Like that, it, that? There's too much wrong with. Uh, no, 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 no. The great no, thing no, about no, about no. inhaled no. aerosol, about for aerosol betas, the great thing about it. This is the one thing you really need to remember. You get the same level with four puffs that you get with one, the same blood level, that you get with one um, albuterol pill. Which means, and that level is trivial. So the, the systemic effects are trivial. You get 100 times more bronchodilation with four puffs, with one puff than you do. So this is incredibly safe. That's why and, and you it, can give continuous betas and, and it's no it big meets, deal. It meets their need. They came to see a doctor. They expect to leave with a prescription. Yeah, that's the they want, you know, everyone who comes to the emergency room, we have a rule. They wait 12 hours to see us or longer. You know, candy-coated popcorn, peanuts, and a prize. Everyone gets something. They all want a prescription. You know that the Z-Pack is the wrong prescription. The albuterol is the right Sorry, prescription. Sorry, let me just say Z-Pack. 
people. The Z pack. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> so happy I'm here. It's really yeah. wonderful. Yeah. yeah. The cultural, my cultural sensitivity monitor. He did try to jump in on that LP, too, I just have to say. <laughs> okay. I think we're done. Thank